Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this lesson about the Articles of Confederation. I am Miss Jennifer Blank. See, there I am. I'm very excited. Very excited to be giving you this lesson on the Articles of Confederation. So, without further ado, here we go. Okay, so we're going to start with a brief, very brief, uh, breakdown of the historical context of the Articles. Then we're going to talk about the historical significance of the Articles. We're going to define them. And we're going to discuss the weaknesses and then also the strengths. Okay, let me start out by saying that if you'd like a more detailed breakdown of the Revolutionary War and the events that led up to the Revolutionary War, I invite you to view my Nomia lessons about those things. So here we're just going to be, this is just going to be a very, very big picture overview, which is going to be good times. So we're going to start out with discussing the abuses that were levied or, or brought to bear on the colonists by the British. Then we're going to discuss the Declaration of Independence, the Revolutionary War, and we're going to talk about the political philosophy of the founding. Fathers. Now you may be asking yourself, Miss Blank, what on earth is political philosophy? Don't worry, I will explain exactly what that is when we get to it. All right, so this is what you really need to know about the relationship between the colonists and the British, the, the colonies and then the mother parent country. All right, for a long, long time, things were actually rolling quite quite well. They were rolling along pretty good. It was good times. You know, the colonists were feeling good about things. The British were feeling good about things. And the British were busy doing all kinds of stuff. So they kind of let the colonists do their own thing. You know, they were governing themselves. They were dealing with their own affairs and handling their business, right? And so the colonists appreciated that. They're like, you know what? I, this, is, this is good times. You're giving me some autonomy. I can handle my business. I appreciate that. But then after a certain point, England was like, oh, dude, we need money. I know, we'll tax the colonies and we'll get money from them. And then the colonists were like, whoa, put the brakes on that. Hold up just a second. Now, you were doing just fine. You know, you used to be so great for England. You used to be wonderful. And now all of a sudden you want to tax me out of all my cash. Like, I'm not, I'm not having this. I'm not down with that. You know, this is an infringement upon my rights as a British citizen. Like, what are you doing to me? So the colonists are looking at this and they're not happy. And you don't need to know about all the things that were done, but I want to point out a couple of things. So the Sugar Act was a big no-no. Hit the pocketbook. Hit the pocketbook. Actually killed some colonists. And then the Intolerable Acts hit a whole lot of things. Um, but, but a lot of them were rights that the colonists really believed they had as British citizens. And the British, seemingly out of the clear blue from the perspective of the colonists, were just like, I want it. I'm taking it. And, and that's it. So all of these issues, you just need to be in mind that the, keep in mind that this was brewing over several decades. Uh, 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 that, that slowly but surely Britain started encroaching upon the rights that the colonists thought they had as British citizens. So this uh, started to cause some serious issues. So after all that craziness, after all those abuses, you know, just put on the colonists by the British, and they're like, you know what, we're over this. We are declaring our independence. We are piecing out of this partnership with Great Britain. We are declaring ourselves to be an independent country. And the guy who actually wrote that, his name was Thomas Jefferson. He's one of our key founding fathers. It was published July 4th, 1776. That's an important date. Everybody should know that. And the key purpose was to declare to the king of England and to the world, not just to the king, but also to the entire world, that, that, the, independent, that the colonies were in fact independent and why they were seeking that independence, why they were separating. It was important to our founders that the rest of the world understand why it was so necessary that we separate and form our own nation. So you see here, there's a nice little graphic of a, a picture of the actual, uh, the actual declaration. And I have some quotes here. This first quote is interesting. Jefferson says, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. Manure, of course, is a fertilizer. So what Jefferson meant by this is that periodically you have to stand up and fight for your rights because people will try to take them from you. And if you don't stand up and, 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 and say something about that and speak up for yourself and the rights that you are entitled to as a human being, then you're going to lose those rights. And sometimes in order to keep freedom alive, you, you periodically need to stand up and throw some punches. And that's what Jefferson's saying there. But one of the, the quotes that I really, really love from him is from the Declaration itself. And I want to make that, that, that graphic a little bigger and, uh, and share that with you here. And he says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, 
and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we take this for granted in America now because we're so used to having it. It's just always been there. But I, I want everyone listening to understand that uh, th this was brand new. This was a, a totally revolutionary brand new concept. And we were attempting to put what was once theory and in the minds of great thinkers, we were going to make that reality. We were going to take a thought and make it real. And that's exactly what we did. And that's what makes America so special. That, that's why we talk about this so much. Because as strange as it is, no one ever thought to take these principles and make them reality. People really believed that humanity was not capable of self-government. And here is Thomas Jefferson saying, uh-uh, yes we are, and watch us do it. All right, so the Revolutionary War wa was hard fought by both colonists and the British. Uh, I'm not going to go into deep detail about the war. I mean, I think we all know how it ended. You know, the United States won, therefore we got our independence. But there were a couple of big picture causes I, I want to point it out. I want to point out to you. And here is a graphic that lays out the causes. All right, mercantilism, which was the economic system of the time, it was meant to help the mother country at the expense of the colonies. So you can see how that might be a problem. Um, for, for the colonists. Enlightenment ideas and the ideas we talked about with the Declaration of Independence, the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, that comes from John Locke. He was a prominent Enlightenment thinker. And uh, so our founders took those Enlightenment ideas. This idea of the Great Awakening, and if you'd like more detail about that, you can check out my, my, no, my previous Nomi lessons. There was a population explosion, and the colonists were able to self-govern for many, many years. You had this thing called the French and Indian War, which the British taxed the colonists to pay for. And as we said earlier, restrictive laws passed by the British. And I, I love this quote from Thomas Jefferson. I just have to point this out. A little rebellion now and then is a good thing. And here's another quote over here on the top right. Revisiting the Revolutionary War is a bracing reminder that the fate of a continent and the shape of the modern world turned on the free choices of remarkably few Americans defying an empire. That's really what the revolution was. We, we were the small little, you know, band of colonists who were taking on the most powerful empire on the planet with the most powerful military on the planet. And we won. So it was definitely an inspiration to many throughout the rest of the world. And, and many would argue it inspired the French Revolution that came after it. All right, so the political philosophy of the Founding Fathers was this thing called classical liberalism. And I'm going to explain what that is in a second. But I want you to understand what a political philosophy is. And that is a complete set of beliefs, set of views about the nature of people, so what are people really like, and what the role of government. What should government do? What shouldn't it do? Okay, And so according to the classical liberalists, they had a, a basic belief in liberty, that government exists to protect natural rights, nothing more, nothing less, and that natural rights are life, liberty, and property. All right, and this idea, this idea of natural rights, uh, John Locke is the dude that came up with that, and he was a really important Brit British political philosopher. Like I said here, he's a really important dude, so I want you to pay attention to that. Now that we understand the historical context of the Articles of Confederation, let's talk about the significance of the Articles of Confederation. And the key significance is right over here. It was the very first system of government used in the United States. Now, something I want you to keep in mind, the Articles of Confederation were confederal governments. All right, confederal, whoops. Wow, I need serious work on my handwriting. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention to your teachers when they tell you to work on penmanship because then you become a teacher and children can't read what you write. All right, so this says confederal government, okay? And what a confederal government was, it was a league of loosely connected independent states. It's kind of like the difference between being really best friends and being like casual acquaintance. Like you just met these people a couple of times and you think they're pretty cool, so you'll hang out every so often. Uh, and that's very different than like your bestest, bestest friend that you hang out with all the time. Now, a lot of the folks uh, that study history and study government talk about the Articles of Confederation as basically being one giant epic fail, you know, because we, we made them and we had them for a while, realized they weren't working out too well, we scrapped them, and they got the Constitution, which is what we still have now. But there were some good things about the Articles, and so I want to talk about what those are right now. So over here in this graphic, you see advantages, and also over here you see advantages. So let's start out with the one on the left. So it included a unified army for the states, all right? So 
it would enable them to come together and build a, an army as a nation, as opposed to individual states like they'd started out with with the revolution. They were able to build and control that army. They had the ability, the ability to deal with foreign countries as one voice, and they set up a legislature where each state had one vote, so it was equal opportunity. Uh, on the on the right hand side here, I want to draw your attention over here, and, and this is these three things are very very important. So the states were protected from the risk of a very powerful and tyrannical central government. Remember, we just fought a war because the king was too much like respect my authority and overbearing and controlling, right? He was a dictator. And we didn't like that. So the government we created under the Articles had a very, very limited central government. Matter of fact, there was no executive. There was no king or president or anything. It was just a Congress. It also gave us real valuable experience in, in government, the actual running of a nation. And this one is the most important thing the Articles did. It passed the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And that is the process by which every state becomes a state. So every single state, all the 50 states that we have in this country, followed this process to become a state. So those are the key strengths. And now we're going to move into discussing the weaknesses. All right, so weaknesses. Now, there is a reason why a lot of experts consider the articles kind of an epic fail, because it kind of was. So let me draw your attention to uh, this graphic over here. You see Young Nation, that represents the United States. You see here the Articles of Confederation, their broken crutches. Useless money, because the articles did not do a good job controlling the nation's money. And the nation is saying, I have so many troubles. I'm weak. I'm poor and in debt. My paper money is useless. The Articles of Confederation do not support me. And that's what these things are supposed to be. They're supposed to be crutches, supports to help you on your way. And uh, it just wasn't working out. So here you see a graphic about the weaknesses and then the outcome of those various weaknesses. Okay, Congress had no power to layer collect taxes, so the government never had any money. Congress had no power to regulate trade between the states or trade with other nations. So you had a lot of economic fights between all the states. And then you couldn't uh, arrange agreements with other countries for trade because nobody could agree on anything. Congress had no power to enforce its laws, so it depended on the states to do that. But if Georgia said, you know what, forget you, I'm not doing this, then the Continental Congress, the, or the, uh, the Articles of Confederation were out of luck. Central government couldn't do anything about it. You needed the approval of nine out of the 13 states to do anything at all. So if you didn't get nine, nothing was getting done. And then any amendments, major things, required unanimous, required everybody to vote yes. So in order to make significant changes, you couldn't do it without everybody saying okay. The government had no executive branch, so there was no clear leader, so you couldn't coordinate things. And there was no national court system, so the central government had no way of, of settling the dispute. So there were some significant weaknesses here. And on the next slide, uh, I'm going to talk to you, I'm just going to show you some, some cool little graphics that really give you a visual of why these things were bad. Right, so here you see a couple of graphics about four of the key uh, weaknesses of the article. So no control over trade, right there. No way to settle quarrels between the states. Amendments require the approval of all. And states made agreements with other nations without consulting the central government. So I'll leave you to your own devices to interpret these visuals for yourself. So as we've seen, we're having some issues with the articles because in some areas they're very weak. So the, the question facing the founders was, their questions facing the founders, should we scrap the articles or should they be tweaked? Which one should we do? So there was definite, uh, definitely a lot of division among the founders. Now after much back and forth and much debate, much argument, and a little bit of a throwdown actually was going on in Philadelphia, they finally decided, no, we're not tweaking them. We need them to go bye-bye. So at that point we started the writing of the Constitution. Now, at, once we wrote it, the states had to come together and ratify or approve uh, the new governing document. And at this point, you get the development of the start, uh, the start of political parties. You have the Federalists on one side who were pro, and the Anti-Federalists on the other side who were anti. The, the Federalists wanted to ratify. The Anti-Federalists said, no, this is no good. We don't want to do this. And if you want more details about that debate and that fight, that's the subject of another lesson. So I invite you to come back and visit my lesson on the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. 
right? So what did we learn? We learned about the big picture historical context of what led up to the development of the articles. We learned why they were significant because they were the first form of government in the United States, which is also the definition. These two are connected. We learned about the strengths and we also learned about the weaknesses. Major strength was the nor passing of the Northwest Ordinance and protection from a tyrannical central government. But weakness, it was so uh, uh, non-central that uh, it couldn't maintain control over national issues. I hope you learned what you need to in this lesson. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next time.